Chapter One. Our heroine's adventures begin. If you had known Catherine Morland as a young child, you would never have imagined that one day she would be the heroine of a novel filled with adventure, mystery, and romance. Her father was a respected clergyman, neither rich nor poor, and her mother was a strong, sensible mother of ten children. The Morlands were often described as a fine family, but that was because there were so many of them, not because any of them were handsome, beautiful, or noticeably talented. For the first ten years of her life, Catherine was as ordinary as the rest of the Morlands. She was thin and clumsy, with dull skin and hair. She spent her time throwing a ball, riding a horse. Or chasing her brothers and sisters, while avoiding any ladylike activities, like arranging flowers, nursing a poor injured pet, or watering a pretty rose bush. And certainly, Catherine's education could not be described as appropriate for a heroine. In fact, she had an obvious dislike for the classroom, and never could learn or understand anything before she was taught. Occasionally, she even seemed rather stupid. Her mother wanted her to learn music, and Catherine was sure she would like to play the piano. So, at eight years old, she began lessons. But she soon gave up, and the day on which the music teacher was dismissed was one of the happiest days of her young life. Her drawing ability was also disappointing, although she enjoyed drawing animals. All her pictures. From chickens to horses, looked very similar. What a strange, incomprehensible character! Incomprehensible, because in spite of such clear signs of a difficult nature, Catherine was seldom unpleasant. She rarely quarrelled, and was very kind to her six younger brothers and sisters, and quite friendly with the three older ones. But it still must be admitted that she was untidy. Noisy and wild, and loved nothing better than rolling down her favourite hill at the back of the house. At fifteen, Catherine's appearance began to improve. Her skin was brighter, her hair was shinier and nicely styled, her eyes shone, and her figure was pleasing. Her love of dirt was replaced by an interest in the latest fashions, and in the possibility. Of going to a ball, she was quite thrilled one day to hear her father remark on her personal improvement. Catherine is almost pretty today. To be almost pretty is a great prize to a girl who has been plain for fifteen years. Catherine had never been interested in books full of facts and useful knowledge, but from the age of fifteen. She began to read the type of books which heroines must read: stories of romance, adventure, and fantasy, set in mysterious foreign places. These supplied her memory with useful instructions about life, death, and especially love. And although she could not write poetry or play the piano or paint a picture, achievements we might expect in a heroine, she began nevertheless. To admire those skills in others. At the beginning of our story, Catherine was seventeen and eager for life. But the world around Fullerton, the village in Wiltshire where the Morlands lived, did not offer the kind of adventure and romance that a heroine needs. Luckily for Catherine, Mister Allen, the gentleman who owned most of the property around Fullerton, was required by his doctor. To go to the city of Bath for a healthy rest. His wife, a good-natured woman with no children of her own, was very fond of Catherine. She understood that a young lady of seventeen is ready to take her place in society, so she invited our heroine to accompany her and Mr. Allen to Bath for the season. When the time came for Catherine's first trip away from home without her family, 
You can imagine the excitement and anxiety in the Morland household. Would Mrs. Morland warn her daughter about the evils of city life and the dangers of mixing with the wrong sort of gentleman? Would her father generously hand her a blank check to cover every need? Would the sister closest to her in age insist that she write to her every day and tell her every detail of her life in Bath? Well, no. This, after all, was an ordinary family from rural England. Mrs. Morland simply said, Catherine, please remember to wear your warm scarf around your throat when you are out in the evening. Mr. Morland gave Catherine a small purse with ten pounds and promised more if it was needed. Catherine's sister Sarah shouted goodbye as she ran out to meet a friend. In fact, the family had not realised that Catherine was going to be a heroine. They cheerfully but quietly sent her off without any dramatic speeches, tears or warnings. The trip to Bath was both calm and safe. The carriage was not stopped by robbers or by stormy weather, nor were the passengers lucky enough to meet a hero before arriving at their destination. But when they arrived in Bath, Catherine felt happy immediately. Her eyes were here, there, everywhere, as the carriage drove through the pretty streets. Soon Mr and Mrs Allen and Catherine were settled in comfortable lodgings in Pulteney Street. And what do we know about Mrs Allen, Catherine's close companion and chaperone for the coming weeks? She was the type of woman who amazes us by finding a husband. Why would any sensible gentleman like Mr. Allen want a wife without beauty, intelligence, achievements, or a pretty manner? Well, she was generally quiet, did not concern herself with his business, and agreed with his opinions on every topic. In addition to these qualities, Mrs. Allen had two special interests that kept her busy and made her a suitable person to introduce a young lady into society. First, she loved going out, and never chose to stay quietly at home. Second, she found endless pleasure in fashion. She would not consider taking Catherine to any of the stylish rooms in Bath until they had both bought new dresses in the latest style. When they were ready to attend their first ball, Mrs. Allen declared that Catherine looked exactly as she should. Such admiration was always very welcome when it came, but Catherine did not depend on it. Nevertheless, on this evening, it made her confident enough to face any crowd of strangers. When they entered the ballroom, Mr. Allen escaped to a side room to play cards with a group of husbands. Meanwhile... The two ladies looked around a very full ballroom and, with Catherine holding her chaperone's arm rather desperately, they struggled through the crowd. They finally found a place on a balcony at the top of the long room with a good view of the company below them. It was a splendid sight and Catherine began, for the first time that evening, to feel that she was really at a ball. She hoped to dance, but did not know anyone in the room. And Mrs. Allen did not see anyone she knew either. Surely I should see a familiar face soon. I wish I could find a partner for you, remarked Mrs. Allen. Catherine had no time to worry about dancing, because before long everyone began to move towards the tea tables. But Catherine and Mrs. Allen were at a distinct disadvantage. Without a party of friends to join, or a polite gentleman to assist them. After being pushed and squeezed by the crowd, they finally found two empty places at the end of a long table where a large group was already seated. The two ladies were ignored, and left with no one to speak to except one another. Well... <laughs> I am very pleased that I have not damaged my new dress in this terrible crowd, I assure you, 
It would have been shocking to have it torn, wouldn't it? Said Mrs. Allen. I must say that I have not seen one dress in the whole room that I prefer to mine. It is very uncomfortable with no friends here, don't you think? Whispered Catherine. What shall we do? The gentlemen and ladies at this table do not look happy with us here. We seem to be forcing ourselves into their party. Yes, it is very disagreeable," said Mrs. Allen. "My good friends, the Skinners, would rescue us if they were here now. Shouldn't we leave? There are no cups or plates for us here, you see," Catherine said with a worried frown. "I think we should sit still," said Mrs. Allen. We shall be pushed and pulled in every direction if we try to find another place in this crowd. My dress could easily be damaged. Mrs. Allen, are you sure there is nobody that you know in this great assembly of people? You must know somebody. Oh, if only I could see a familiar face," Mrs. Allen said. "Oh, look, there goes a strange-looking woman." What an odd, old-fashioned dress! Look at the back of it. How awful! After some time, the two ladies received a polite offer of tea from one of their neighbours at the table. They accepted gratefully, and enjoyed a little light conversation with the gentleman. But that soon ended, and no one else spoke to them during the entire evening. When the dancing came to an end. Mr. Allen found Catherine and his wife. Well, Miss Morland, he said, I hope you have had an agreeable ball. Very agreeable indeed, Catherine replied politely, trying unsuccessfully to hide a great yawn. As the ballroom began to empty, and the crowd grew smaller, our heroine had a better opportunity to be admired. In her hearing, two gentlemen commented on her. To one another, there's a pretty girl. Where was she all evening? Such words had a strong effect. Catherine immediately thought that the evening had been very pleasant. Perhaps an experienced heroine would expect more, but Catherine left the ball perfectly satisfied with her share of public attention. Chapter two. Extremely agreeable introductions. Every morning now brought its regular duties for Catherine and Mrs. Allen: visiting shops, exploring Bath, attending the pump room, where they walked up and down for an hour, looking at everybody and speaking to no one. Mrs. Allen repeated her usual disappointment every morning. Oh, my dear, I would very much like to find someone I know in this crowd. Then, on Friday evening, when they arrived in the lower rooms, Catherine's fortunes improved. Mr. King, whose job was to act as host, introduced Catherine to a young gentleman as her dance partner. Mr. Henry Tilney was about twenty-five years old, rather tall, with a pleasing, if not quite handsome, face, and in general, an intelligent and energetic manner. He spoke politely, and Catherine felt lucky to have him as a partner. When the two young people retired to the tea table, Catherine discovered that Mr. Tilney was very entertaining company. After some polite conversation, he said in a dramatic whisper, "Miss Morland, I must apologise. I have not asked you how long you have been in Bath. If you have been here before." Whether you have been in the upper rooms, to the theatre, to a concert, forgive me, and allow me to begin my list of questions immediately.、Mm -hmm. Then Mr. Tilney, with a bow, and in an exaggerated, extremely polite voice, asked, "Have you been in Bath long, madam?" "About a week, sir," answered Catherine, trying not to laugh. "A week." Really," replied Mr. Tilney, 
with excessive surprise. Why should you be so surprised, sir? asked Catherine. She too was now speaking like an actor in the theatre. That is a good question, said Tilney in his normal voice. But reacting to your answers with appropriate emotions and gestures is my duty. Now, let us continue. Were you ever here before, madam? Never, sir, replied Catherine, enjoying the game. How interesting, cried Mr. Tilney, continuing with his actor's voice. Have you been to the upper rooms, the theatre, the concert hall? And are you totally pleased with Bath? Catherine smiled at her companion and said, Yes, I have been everywhere. And I like the city very much. She turned her head away not knowing whether she should laugh or not. Miss Morland, will you be writing unkind things about me in your journal? I predict you will say, Friday went to the lower rooms and had to dance with a silly man who bothered me with his strange conversation delivered in a funny voice. I would never say such a thing, objected Catherine. May I tell you what you ought to say? asked Mr. Tilney. Please, sir. I danced with a very agreeable young man. We enjoyed a great deal of pleasant conversation, and he seemed a most extraordinary and intelligent person. I hope I get to know him better. That, madam, is what I wish you to write in your journal. But perhaps I do not have a journal. Not have a journal? How will you relive every dance, every flattering word, every admiring glance? My dear madam, I think writing a journal is delightful and so particularly suited to the talents of young ladies whose usual writing style is perfectly faultless, except in two areas, a lack of subject and... No attention to the essential rules that govern the English language. You do not have a very high opinion of ladies' talents. Actually, I believe that in every area where good taste is the basis for success, high achievement is quite fairly divided between the sexes, finished Mr. Tilney. But then... This interesting discussion was interrupted by Mrs. Allen. My dear Catherine, can you look at my dress? Have I torn it? It cost me more than any other dress in my wardrobe. Madam, I can see why it was so expensive, said Mr. Tilney. Miss Morland's dress, on the other hand, is pretty, but the fabric is too delicate. It will not wash well. Catherine began laughing and said... Sir, how can you be so... She almost said, strange. But Mrs. Allen was delighted to talk about her favourite subject, and Mr. Tilney was polite enough to continue chatting about fabrics and current fashions for another five minutes. When Mr. Tilney and Catherine returned to the dance floor, he noticed a troubled look on his partner's face. What are you thinking of, so seriously? he asked. Catherine blushed. She had been wondering if Mr. Tilney had been too obviously teasing Mrs. Allen. But she said, I was not thinking of anything. You would not look so serious if something had not upset you. I would prefer to be told at once that you choose not to tell me what you are thinking. Well, then, I choose not to tell you, replied Catherine, with clear determination. Thank you, said her dance partner. Now I can tease you about your serious secret thoughts and opinions whenever we meet. 
Nothing brings people closer than a bit of teasing. They danced again, and when the assembly closed, Catherine, at least, hoped that there would be many more opportunities to continue their friendship. She did not intend to dream of Henry Tilney that night. As a famous writer has insisted, a young lady must not dream about a gentleman or fall in love with him before the gentleman declares his love for her. As Catherine's host and protector, Mr. Allen inquired about her dance partner. Discovering that Henry Tilney was a clergyman from a very respectable family in Gloucestershire allowed him to feel satisfied that he had done his duty. With more than usual eagerness, Catherine hurried to the pump room the next day. She felt sure that she would see Mr. Tilney there, and she was ready to meet him with a smile. But unfortunately, no smile was required. It seemed that every other creature in Bath arrived in the room during the fashionable hours. Only Henry Tilney remained absent. Mrs. Allen once again repeated her usual complaint. How pleasant Bath would be if we had some acquaintances here. This wish had been repeated by Mrs. Allen so often that it is not surprising that on this morning she had her reward. When she and Catherine sat down, the woman to their right stared at them for a few seconds before crying, Madam, if my eyes do not deceive me, your name is Allen. Looking closely at the woman next to her, Mrs. Allen cried in delight. Mrs. Thorpe, my old school friend, it is you, isn't it? The two ladies had not been in contact for more than 15 years, and now their joy in meeting again was enormous. They chatted excitedly, talking both at the same time, and each much more interested in giving than receiving information. Although Mrs. Thorpe was a widow, and not a very rich one, she had one great advantage over Mrs. Allen. She had three sons and three daughters. Mrs. Allen had no children to talk about, but as she listened to all the news about the Thorpe children, she enjoyed noticing that her old friend's costume was quite inferior to anything in her own wardrobe. Look, here are my dear girls, cried Mrs. Thorpe, pointing at three smart-looking females moving towards them. The tallest, the most beautiful, and most elegant is Isabella, my eldest. After Mrs. Allen was introduced, she presented Catherine Morland to the Thorpe ladies. Miss Morland! You are the picture of your brother, the Thorpes cried. They quickly explained that their brother John was at Oxford University and was a great friend of James Morland, Catherine's brother, who was studying to be a clergyman like his father. Catherine remembered that James had recently visited a college friend and his family near London, and this was the family. How lovely! Soon the eldest Thorpe girl, Isabella, invited Catherine to take her arm and walk round the room with her. Catherine was so delighted that she almost forgot Henry Tilney while she was talking to Miss Thorpe. Friendship is certainly the finest medicine for the pain of disappointed love. Because Miss Isabella Thorpe was four years older, Catherine felt that she could learn a lot about society from her new friend. When they parted, she watched Isabella as she walked away. She admired the older girl's graceful walk, her lovely figure, her fashionable dress, and she felt extremely lucky to have found such a charming companion. That evening at the theatre, and the next morning in the warm sunshine in the Crescent, Catherine enjoyed the sweet pleasure of her new and agreeable friendship with Isabella. She was so much happier than she had been in her first week in Bath. But she desired another meeting with Mr. Henry Tilney and could find him nowhere. He must have left Bath 
although he had not mentioned his departure on Friday evening. Of course, this sort of mysterious behaviour is always attractive in a hero, and it made our heroine anxious to know more about him. Isabella loved to hear anything with even a hint of romance, and wanted to know everything about Henry Tilney. Therefore, he became a regular topic of conversation for the two young ladies. Catherine relived every moment that she had spent with the young gentleman, and Isabella analysed the situation and gave advice from her superior experience and wisdom. He must be a charming young man, and I'm sure he found you equally charming. He must have important business in Gloucestershire and will soon return to Bath. And he is a clergyman. I have a particular liking for clergymen, Isabella said, in a rather dreamy voice. Not being experienced in the etiquette of romance, Catherine did not demand to know the cause of Isabella's emotional response to clergymen. Perhaps, as a good friend, she should have insisted that her friend tell her more about her particular liking. The friendship between the two girls nevertheless continued to grow and to become more and more affectionate. Even if the weather was very poor, the two young ladies walked through mud and rain to sit together and read novels. Yes, novels. To many people, novels are considered to be nothing more than foolish nonsense. But why? Novels may not be as serious as books about history or science or even art. But novels have humour, mystery, culture and elegance. Do not therefore say, Oh, it is only a novel. Read novels and learn everything about human nature in the most delightful language and through the most entertaining plots. Our two young ladies, you will see, had already learned this lesson. Listen to their conversation in the pump room after a friendship of only eight or nine days. My dear Catherine, Isabella began, I saw the prettiest hat you can imagine in the shop in Milsom Street. I must say that I longed to have it. But Catherine, what have you been doing all morning? Have you read more Udolpho? Oh, yes, cried Catherine. I am at the part with the black veil. You are desperate to know what is behind the veil, aren't you? Do not tell me. I know it must be Laurentina's bones. Oh, I love Udolpho. I assure you that only a meeting with you could persuade me to come away from it. How charming of you. When you finish Udolpho, I have a list of ten or twelve other Gothic novels that I am certain you will love, Isabella said. But are they all frightening and full of dark secrets and mysterious accidents? Hoped Catherine. Of course, Isabella assured her. My friend Miss Andrews has recommended them to me. Miss Andrews is as beautiful as an angel, and I often scold men terribly for not admiring her. Scold them? Do you really scold them for not admiring her? asked Catherine, who was quite shocked by Isabella. Yes. In fact, I told Captain Hunt at a ball this winter that even if he teased me all evening, I would not dance with him unless he admitted that Miss Andrews was beautiful. I am determined to show men that we ladies are capable of real friendship. For example, if I heard anybody say anything negative about you, I would quickly lose my temper. Of course, that will not happen, because you will always be a great favourite with the men. How can you say that? Catherine cried, blushing bright red. Dear Catherine, Miss Andrews is really quite dull compared to you. I saw a young man watching you yesterday, 
and I am sure he is in love with you. Don't look embarrassed. I understand perfectly that your heart is attached to another man who shall remain nameless. But I may never see Mr. Tilney again, said Catherine rather desperately. Don't say that I've lost my heart to him. I will not think about him. Instead, I shall worry about the black veil. Well, my dear, we will change the subject. Have you decided what you will wear tonight? I am determined to dress exactly like you. The men take notice of that sometimes, you know. Does it mean anything? asked Catherine innocently. Mean anything? <laughs> I make it a rule to ignore what men notice or what they say. They are often very bold if you do not treat them with spirit and make them keep their distance. Are they bold? Men always behave very politely to me, said Catherine, feeling quite confused. Oh, men think they are so important. But listen, I have meant to ask you something. Do you prefer men with dark or fair hair? I have not really thought about it, answered Catherine. But perhaps neither. <laughs> Something between the two. A medium brown. That sounds like your description of Mr. Tilney's hair. And he has dark brown eyes, if I remember correctly. I actually prefer fair hair and blue eyes better than any other. But do not reveal my preference... If you know anyone like that. Why would I do that? Catherine asked, feeling more confused than ever. Catherine, let us drop the subject for now. Let us move to the other end of the room. I believe there are two bold young men near us who have been staring at me for more than half an hour. The young ladies walked to the book at the front of the room. Watch those two young men, dear Catherine. I hope they're not following us. I refuse to take any notice of them. There's nothing to worry about, dear Isabella, Catherine assured her friend. They have left the pump room. Which way did they go? asked Isabella in a rush. One was very good looking. They went towards the church. Well, I'm very glad that I've got rid of them, insisted Isabella. Now, please accompany me to the hat shop. That would be lovely, agreed Catherine, but we may see those two young men if we go in that direction. I will not take any notice of them. If I did, it would spoil them and make them believe they were important. Catherine did not know how to argue against this logic, so she and her friend walked as quickly as possible towards the hat shop, following in the steps of the two young men.